My name is Reverend Naomi Washington Lee Part. Um, I live in Philadelphia and I am the director for faith based and interfaith affairs in the mayor's office of public engagement. Uh, and so that means I'm the public facing uh, faith leader in city government. Um, I support faith communities in terms of their relationships uh, with city government, translate what's going on at a policy level for faith communities, uh, try to create um, strategic ways for faith communities to give their feedback and become engaged in the work of city government. Um, and, you know, I think of myself also as a person who, who wants to celebrate and affirm the religious diversity in our city um, in all the ways that I can. So it's, it's amplifying and celebrating the religious life um, in, in Philadelphia. I also teach theology uh, at Villanova University, which is a Catholic university here in the Metro Philly area. I've done that for the last three years, and I feel so uh, honored to be able to teach undergraduates um, how to think and reason theologically uh, together. So that's also part of my work, too. So my work has, has really taken shape. I, I think within the context of the pandemic, I just started in this role in October of 2019. So five months in, here we here we were uh, in the middle of shifting and adapting to the realities of COVID-19. I think that my work before was really uh, the slow burn of building relationships. You know, I was having all of these one-to-ones. I'm a former organizer, faith organizer, so I know the the strategy around one-to-one -one building relationships, visiting houses of worship, trying to um, become familiar with religious life here in Philadelphia. I mean, I've been here for 20 years, but um, not in this role. And sort of in the midst of the pandemic, uh, I'm now doing that. It seems that at a lightning speed and virtually. Um, so have, uh, we have weekly uh, COVID-19 update calls for faith leaders, which is something that I wasn't doing, you know, before, before the pandemic. Um, but that is now deepening the relationships I have with individual faith leaders and with faith communities because we're on the phone and we're on the, the video chat every single week trying to make sure that they're updated with the latest city guidance. Um, we've had some virtual events. Um, so, uh, we've had one um, really successful webinar that helps people navigate this terrain of grief right now. So, we, we framed it as COVID-19 has, has us experiencing loss in ways that we could not have anticipated. And so, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how to live with loss and live through loss. Um, and we had a, a webinar around how faith communities can support people who are not feeling safe at home due to family or relational violence uh, at home uh, and how faith communities can support and respond to that. So, so everything that, all of the ways of engagement that we kind of intended to, um, uh, to embark upon before the pandemic, we're doing them now contextualizing them for the pandemic. Um, and so that my work has really been defined by the pandemic in that way. I think that also I would say in terms of the theology classroom at Villanova, we of course shut down campus and went to a completely digital learning environment. Um, and I find it fascinating and really appropriate that we were teaching theology and in wrestling theologically during a pandemic. Um, the material is right there in our real lives. Um, and so I think that it made our conversations much more meaningful, much more tangible, uh, because we could zoom out and look at the, the reality of the pandemic and then ask our theological questions. At Villanova, I teach a class called Do Black Lives Matter to God? And I've, I've taught this class for the last three years. 
it's fundamentally a class about suffering, human suffering, and particularly suffering as experienced by Black people in America, this protracted, generations-long, um, intractable suffering uh, due to white supremacy. And so imagine teaching that course within the context of a pandemic that is disproportionately impacting Black folks. Um, and so we were able to bring in examples uh, from real life that help us to ask better questions theologically. Um, how is God act acting um, in the lives of Black folks who are suffering due to COVID-19? Um, who, who should be responsible uh, when a virus seems to unjustly and disproportionately impact certain communities and not others? Is it a human responsibility? Does God have anything to do with it? So we were able to ask much more specific questions, I think, in that course, because we had the, the raw material of the pandemic to consider. Well, we, we thought that this was a conversation we needed to have because we wanted to nuance what it means to be safe and be home at the same time, right? We know that some children live with their abusers. We know that some spouses live with their abusers. And so to be quarantined at home with a person who has been violent toward you um, is a complicated kind of grief. I mean, you can't, you can't enact your safety plan right now. Um, you can't necessarily rely on some of the same systems of accountability that are in place. Say, for example, school social workers um, when nobody's in school. And, and so we wanted to have a conversation, not just about how faith communities could respond uh, to domestic violence and to family violence right now, but also how faith communities can begin to embrace ideas that dismantle cultures of violence um, and the cycles of abuse. So it was both an ideological conversation that we had uh, in that webinar and a practical one. Um, and so we had experts from um, local organizations called Women Against Abuse, uh, an organization called WAR, which is the Philadelphia Center for um, Sexual, Against Sexual Violence. Um, we had the executive director of the Office of Engagement for Women come on um, so we could talk about toxic masculinities, um, even toxic femininities. How do these toxic gender dynamics play a role? You know, we know that people right now are stretched. They're stretched financially. They're stretched in terms of their patients. Um, and so we know that the high stress of the moment leaves people vulnerable to living into aggression and violence or receiving, being victimized by aggression and violence. And so we wanted to talk about the uniqueness of this moment and how we could, could respond. So, I mean, I was, I was really surprised that one of the experts that we had on the call from one of our organizations said that they've seen um, 50 percent less calls, 50 percent fewer calls related to child abuse during the pandemic than in under kind of pre-pandemic circumstances because you don't have the same eyes um, present in the lives of the children who are victimized by abuse. So you don't have the teacher making the report. You don't have the other kinds of mandated reporters able to see what's going on and, and, and try to hold people accountable. So that was an alarming statistic. She also said that they've seen an increase in calls related to domestic violence. Um, so again, pointing to, you know, when people have lost their jobs, when people are afraid they might get sick, um, when people are stressed because they have essential work to do and they're putting themselves in harm's way every time they leave their house, then we know that that's a recipe sometimes for the cycles of abuse. Yeah. I have been really um, blown away by how I've seen faith leaders step up. Um, we've, on, I said we had these weekly faith leaders calls and so on these calls, we have people saying, 
can we still run our food pantry? We, we want to be able to make sure food is available, not just to our members, but to members of the community. We know we're going to shut down for worship, but can we still run these food distribution programs? How do we do that safely? And so we, we issued some guidance around that. We developed a program so that faith-based communities can partner with faith-based food distribution programs. So in case they need volunteers, members of congregations can plug right in to those food distribution programs. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a, an entity and initiative that we stood up in response to congregations saying, we want to help, and uh, help us do, those, do so safely. Uh, we have congregations with lots of property saying to the city, listen, if you happen to need our space for any reason, here. You can come and use our property, use our building, use our parking lot. Um, and so we developed a form so that people can express interest in sharing their building um, for COVID response. Um, congregations have been testing locations here in Philadelphia. So making, again, making their property available to uh, the Department of Public Health, um, to independent doctors who are organizing testing. Uh, in hard to reach communities. Um, and we've also had every single weekend, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, prayer pauses. Um, this is an initiative that I started back in March to offer just short 15 minute words of reflection and encouragement for the city. And we, we get on Zoom and then we stream them to Facebook Live. And we've seen anywhere from 200 people uh, gather to watch these prayer pauses to 4,000 people who end up viewing the prayer pauses. And every time I ask a faith leader, will you do this? The answer is yes. Um, and so we've had people from a variety of traditions, the Abrahamic traditions, Buddhist tradition, um, humanist tradition. Um, we've had immigrant faith leaders offer prayers in multiple languages. I mean, it's just been a, a wonderful experience. So I have really seen faith leaders step up uh, and rise to the occasion, whatever we've asked them to do. Yeah, well, people need to be able to hold both their fear and their hope at the same time. Um, and what this moment has done is present an opportunity to sort of destigmatize fear. I mean, I've heard so much rhetoric around faith has no room for fear and let's you know, our faith means we are not afraid. And I just really wanted to redeem fear and redeem anger and redeem grief as natural responses to a pandemic. <laughs> you know, people are dying. People are sick. People are feeling out of control. People feel trapped. Um, and so we are rightly afraid, right? I think that what we've been saying is your fear and your faith can go together. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. You can have hope and you can be grief stricken at the same time, like a grief stricken hope, right? Um, and so this is an opportunity to really interrupt some, what I would consider problematic ways of probably problematic postures, problematic orientation when tragedy strikes. That's why I'm so passionate. I teach classes on suffering, uh, mainly because I have my own questions. I have my own wrestling around that. But also because I think you, we see the vulnerabilities of our faith during times like this, during tragedies. We see the gaps. Uh, we see the loopholes. We see the, the potholes in our faith. Um, and so I'm hopeful that, that we won't actually go back to, to normal. We won't go back to what, uh, the, the maybe placating or numbing kinds of, of theologies that we espoused before, um, that will come out of this more theologically honest, um, more courageous. Um, better able to hold what seems like a paradox 
uh, you know, our joys and our sorrows together, our faith and our fear together. So I hope I hope we do that. I hope we don't go back to normal. Um, and and then on the kind of political side, this is really exposing for some people, but reminding other people, we got a long way to go socially and politically. Um, taking care of those who are most vulnerable, um, visioning ahead, planning, getting away from this triumphalist kind of narrative around, you know, we can just we can just conquer anything and anybody. It's like, no, this virus has really taken us out uh, in ways, and so we're not we're not indefensible. We're not um, we're not immortal. Um, we we are not great um, in all of the ways we think we are as a nation, right? And so I hope we go we go someplace else after this, that we construct another way of being, another way of governing, another way of allocating resources um, so that not only are we better prepared for another kind of tragic situation like this, but we're just better as a nation. Uh, we're better on a regular, regular day. Um, so that's my hope. Um, my fear, it, my fear would be if we did go back to normal and nothing, nothing changes. That would be a shame. That would be a sin and a shame. I want to offer a word of encouragement um, to those of you who might be feeling some guilt or shame during this pandemic. You might feel this way because you've been told you're overreacting. You're making a big deal. You've been more sad than you've been in a long time and you find yourself crying or nervous and you're not used to feeling that way. Maybe somebody close to you is sick. Maybe somebody close to you has died and the grief is stuck in the back of your throat or stuck in the pit of your stomach. I want to encourage you. My word to you is to feel, feel whatever you feel deeply. I'm reminded of the words of Toni Morrison. I want to feel what I feel, even if it's not happiness. Feel. My friend, the Reverend Kyle Brooks, said something profound to me, and I want to share an adapted version of his words with you. The measure of this pandemic moment is not and will not be how well we're able to fake it, to feign being unaffected or unbothered by the present state of affairs. The state of being unbothered is often a symptom of our acceptance of chaos as the status quo. That response is a coping mechanism, a numbing agent meant to make us unfeeling in the presence of overwhelming feelings. So the challenge of this moment, the call to a collective effort, is to remain feeling people in the midst of deafening and deadening waves of noise, of despair, of sickness, of even violence, of indifference. We are not sealed off from the suffering of those who share in our ecosystems of life. So now is the time to be instruments of feeling. This is my prayer. Make us instruments of feeling, God. Withdraw if you must. Retreat when it gets overwhelming. Cry when you can't help but cry. Mourn the weight of loss and death. Mourn the absence of touch, the loneliness of isolation. And laugh too, when you feel like it. Feel the joy of experiencing your life in a different way now, perhaps in a slower way, an uncluttered way, a more attuned way. Dance to the changing rhythms of your days and your nights. See your body anew, not as a threat you cannot control, not as host 
to a virus, but as flesh you must now listen to more deeply. This is my prayer. Now is the time. God, make us instruments of feeling. Because when the threat of COVID-19 has passed, we can't afford to go back. Back to numbness, back to indifference, back to the kind of distancing that makes us indifferent about those who are living in sickness and in hunger and in poverty and in incarceration. We can't go back to ignoring the violence against the most vulnerable of us, black folks and brown folks and native folks, transgender folks. Feel now so you can feel later. This is my prayer. Lord, make us instruments of feeling. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>